Good morning, God's peace to you. It's great to be with you this morning. I pray that you're blessed for being here in this place. The uh, Communist Manifesto makes a platform for Marxism. Uh, the only actual manifestation of Marxism developed in the communist movements of the 20th century. And according to the Foundation for Economic Education, there were five things Marx wanted to abolish besides private property. These five things included nation states. The idea is that the worker would eventually replace the nation state and there would be uh, an egalitarian civilization that no longer needed multiple nations. You just have a global uh, commune, <laughs> communist uh, society. Uh, they want to get rid of history and the traditions connected with history, the past. Uh, too much attachment to the past leads to people holding on to traditions that might undermine the, the communist agenda. They wanted to get rid of, rid of religion, of course, because religion suggested there were things such as eternal truths that might get in the way of progress. They wanted to get rid of individuality because the only way a communist or socialist system even works is if everyone is given and distributed to equally. And no one can rise above and be an individual or stand out without threatening that egalitarian approach. And the fifth thing they wanted to eliminate was the family. Marx wrote, on what foundation is the present family, the bourgeois family, based on capital, on private gain? It, in its completely developed form, this family exists only among the bourgeoisie. So if you're poor, Marx thought you're, you didn't, family didn't work for you. It was more of a burden than a blessing. According to Marx, abolishing the family would be relatively easy once bourgeois property was abolished. He said the bourgeois family will vanish as a matter of course when its complement vanishes, private property, and both will vanish with the vanishing of capital. Well, Marx has vanished and the communist movements throughout the world are continuing to vanish. But in today's world, the Marxist revolutionaries are still at work. They've co-opted much of the education systems in this country, and they've started numerous movements for social justice along Marxist lines. And once again, they're attacking the family. The second wave of the feminist movement was largely co-opted by a Marxist turn toward materialism. They evaluated progress for women purely in materialistic terms, that is money, power, and privilege. Even Betty Friedan admitted that the movement was more about tearing down male power in terms of money and professional careers than it was about women in family life. Recent movements aimed at racial justice have also been influenced by Marxism. The BLM movement famously published a website that claimed one of the goals of the movement was to eliminate f traditional family structures. And this page has since been removed, but I doubt the, the goal has been removed. And then there are movements within American churches, progressive Christian theology, which has taken aim at the traditional family structure and marriage between a man and a woman, which is at the core of the biblical vision for the family. So-called progressive Christians support the redefinition of marriage to include same-sex partners and denigrate the importance of the family in favor of finding community in affinity groups, your friendship groups, your uh, your local neighborhood, those kind of things. We need that. We don't necessarily need the family. You could go on and look at the movements and the things that are going on in society. And I don't think I, I'm blowing you away with facts here. We're all aware that the family has been under attack in many ways. 
And it is yet, it's still at the core of what it means to be human. As we study what the Bible has to say about being made in God's image, the Imago Dei, one of the key things is that we have been made male and female for the purpose of making, forming, and living out what it is to be a family. And so we're going to continue this thought on the Imago Dei and, and see that the biblical vision values marriage and family in a way that the world so often does not. We go back to that key passage in Genesis. In fact, we're going to spend quite a while in the book of Genesis today. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. Now, in the book of Genesis, we have essentially two creation stories. We have the creation story in Genesis chapter 1, and then we have the creation story in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 1, it's the big picture. It's the 30,000 foot view of God's creation of the heavens and the earth. And what we get about the nature of human beings in Genesis chapter 1 is big picture. We're made in God's image and likeness. We're made to have dominion over the earth as representatives of God here on the earth. In Genesis chapter 2, things turn to a more personal uh, ground view of what's going on in creation. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 8, it says, The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. You see this garden, you see the man in the garden. It's a... It's not a bird's eye view, but it's up close and personal. There in verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. So here you have the man in the garden. He's having dominion not just over the earth and everything in the earth like chapter 1, but specifically he's given the task of tending the garden, cultivating the garden. Then in Genesis 2 verse 17, scripture says, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for on the day that you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, all of this happens in Genesis chapter two before woman is made. Adam is put in the garden. He is made from the dust of the earth. And so you have in Genesis 1 a, a picture of how man is like God. In Genesis 2, you have a picture of how man is like the animals, a creature of dust. And yet he's not quite like the animals either. He's given charge over the garden and over all those things. And yet there's something missing. In verse 18, the first time in the creation story we find that something isn't good. All throughout the creation, right? God reviews it and he says over and over, it is good, it is good, it is very good. But in Genesis 2 verse 18, something ain't good. Scripture says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper corresponding to him. I will make him a helper corresponding to him. Now, this is the one thing in God's good creation that needed refining. And that is to not simply have Adam, the man, but to have woman, male and female. In Genesis 1, you get the big picture view. Here it goes down to ground level and we see the need for male and female so that we won't be 
alone. It's not good to be alone. If you've ever felt alone, you know the truth of what the scripture is saying here. And the solution to that alienation, that loneliness that each of us experience as human beings is to be found in family, in male and female. We go on in chapter two, verse 19, the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman for she was taken from man. The one thing that needed refined was resolved through the creation of the woman. There would no longer be alienation. There would no longer be loneliness. And Adam is brought to this conclusion. <coughs> excuse me. He's brought to this conclusion because he's first given this task to name all the creatures of the earth, all the animals and the livestock, and they all come before him. And Adam names them. I can't imagine how long that must have taken. But you do see the contrast when Eve is presented to Adam. And he says, oh, no, this one's different. This one's not like the others. This one's different. At last, this one is like me. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now, the key word perhaps a lot of people focus on in Genesis 2 when it comes to the creation of the woman is this word helper or the old King James, the help meet. And sometimes people will use this in a denigrating way, kind of like a mother might say to her four-year-old, it's time to be mother's little helper or something like that. That would be to misunderstand what the Bible is saying entirely. The word helper can mean someone who just provides help with a task or something like that. It can also mean a defender, a rescuer. And it does not signify anything in terms of strength or weakness or rank. It is much more a term designating role, a term designating purpose. And it's a term that's used in the Old Testament to describe God in his relationship with the people of Israel. In Psalm 33, there in verse 20, the psalmist says, we wait for the Lord. He is our help and shield. This is the same word that is used to describe woman as a helper. It's the same word used to describe God as a helper. Look at Psalm 118. Psalm 118 there in verse 7. The Lord is my helper. Therefore, I will look in triumph on those who hate me. Now, I suppose if you need help, then you'd probably like the Lord to be your helper, wouldn't you? And if you're a man and you need help, and you do, then you need a good woman to be your helper, a strong woman, a smart woman, a woman who can help you because you need help. Because you have been tasked as an image bearer, 
as a re representative of God, a steward of the earth, the creation. You've been given this great task, this responsibility, and you need help. And so you want to have the best help. And that's what God did when he created woman. He created someone who could truly help Adam. And one of the great things about women, I'll just say, is that they're not men. In fact, that's my favorite thing about women. They're not men. They provide something that a man cannot provide. Now today, there's a lot of discussion about do children need both a mother and a father? Well, if you grew up without a mother or father or a mother or father who was not doing their job well, let's just put it that way. I think you already know the answer to that question, but there's been a lot of research as well. And the, the conclusions are pretty sound at this point. Yes, children who have both a mother and a father have far less risky behavior in their childhood and adolescence, and they tend to do better as adults. Having both a father and mother is a good thing. It's a very good thing. And to take that away from a child in the name of love is love or something like that is not a good thing. We go back to the biblical vision of human nature. And it is a vision of being created in God's image and likeness, male and female. That's why it works, by the way. We're not just taking a pragmatic approach. I'm a little weary and tired of the church being pragmatists. Let's just do what works. Let's do what meets the moment. Let's figure out what's going on and let's try to be pragmatic so that we can somehow accomplish our goal in this world. And what that ends up with is many times the church becomes more like the world than the world becoming more like the church. Because we're just trying to make it work. What we need to do is go back and stand on the eternal principles, the biblical worldview that we have been given by God's revelation through the Holy Spirit. Because I have a feeling that God knew what he was doing when he created male and female. I have a feeling God knew what he was doing when he brought them together to be joined together as husband and wife. Now, we've looked at Genesis 1, we've looked at Genesis 2, we've got to go to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, we find almost an exact reversal of what you see in Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 1 and 2, human beings are created, right? You've got the woman as the helper of the man and the man who is obeying God, listening to God. In Genesis 3, what do you have? You have the woman who's listening to the serpent, not God. And you have the man helping her do what the serpent said. You have almost a complete reversal of the created order in Genesis 1 and 2 in Genesis chapter 3. Let's read there beginning in verse 8. After the after Adam and Eve sinned, we find in verse 8, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. At the time, the, uh, at the time, the evening, at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So here's this case. It's classic case. You know you've messed up. You've done the wrong thing. And here comes accountability. In, in this case, in the presence of God, in the evening breeze. And so they hide among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, so the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat? From the tree that I commanded you not to eat from. Now, you remember, Adam was given the command. 
that you can eat of any tree except for that tree in the middle of the garden. Adam was the one who received that command long before Eve was even created. And so Adam is the one that's called to account for what has happened. He's the one that's responsible. It was his job to lead Eve into following God. But what happened is Eve led Adam into following the serpent. And so God says, did you eat of the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Verse 12, the man replied, the woman you gave me, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. Insert joke about man blaming his wife for all his problems. Well, that's what we do 90% of the time, right? It's the blame game. I wouldn't have done this if it wasn't for this. I wouldn't have had to do this if it wasn't because you did that. Adam is called to account, but does he take responsibility? No, (laughs) no. He blames the woman. And not only that, you notice there's a little undertone of blaming God. He says, the woman you gave me. Remember, this was your idea that she was going to be here. Adam knew how to deflect. And yet he was the one God called to account for what had happened. So verse 13, the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. She just followed Adam's example, right? I can blame others too for my behavior. She pointed to the serpent. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. And he said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor. All the days of your life, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. Now, you'll notice here, there are curses upon the serpent, the woman, and the man, but the man is the only one who's held responsible for the curse on the earth. He says, because of you, Adam, the whole earth is cursed. Now, there's a reversal that happens in Genesis 3. It's a reversal of God's created order. Adam was given the command. He was called to lead his wife to protect her. And what did he do? He let her be deceived and he followed her lead into sin. So God held him accountable. He held Eve accountable. He held the serpent accountable. But Adam was especially accountable for a lack of leadership and protection. In today's world, the dismantling of gender differences and gender roles is the primary mode of destroying the family. If there is nothing different between a man and a woman, then there's nothing different between a husband and a wife or a mother and a father. So what's the big deal of having two fathers or two mothers? If there's no differences between men and women, essentially, then 
It should just be an egalitarian, uh, everybody kind of uh, work together and nobody is accountable or responsible for how things go. We just independent little pods and we're responsible for what we do and we make transactional agreements and things like that, but we don't have any responsibility for anyone else. And isn't that what we're seeing today? We're seeing people who aren't responsible for their families. Men walk out the door and never come back. Children are raised without any kind of authority or discipline or love or nurture. Because men are not taking care of their families. Now I'm going a little heavy on the guys. Why am I doing that? Because it's easier to do that? Because it's just my opinion? No, because that's what the Bible says. That's what I just read from scripture. And when God calls us men to account, it's not going to be any different than when he called Adam to account. That doesn't let you ladies off the hook, by the way. The worst thing a helper can do is stand by while the one she's supposed to be helping doesn't do their job. A good helper will call that man to accountability as well and call them to responsibility and tell them no when they are going against God's will. A good helper will take on their responsibility to provide what they can. Now, a lot of the research out there makes it very clear that on the whole, men and women are very similar in most ways, but it's a little tedious at this point to try and prove that they're different. Do I need to do that? In terms of personality, we know that men and women are generally the same. The distribution of personality traits pretty much across the board, except for two differences, two, two personality traits that tend to be a little bit different across the board. It's basically that women tend to be a little more agreeable and they tend to have a little more sensitivity to negative emotion. Did you know that? Did you, did you need to have that research? Did you know that men sometimes are insensitive and aren't aware that people are upset? Have you ever had to tell your man, hey, I think you just hurt that person's feelings, or I think you just said something that they might not have appreciated, or you're being a little harsh? Why is that? Because men and women aren't the same. Newsflash. Newsflash. Women are more sensitive to negative emotion. And that's really helpful, especially since women tend to be mothers. And mothers take care of infants who you have to be very sensitive to when an infant is in distress. If that mother is sensitive to that, She's going to be able to provide the care and nurturing that that child needs. Now, there's somewhere not too long, maybe around four, three or four years old, that basically responding to every little sign of distress in a child is starting to be not helpful. And if you think about it, women tend to be, especially mothers, tend to be that nurturing part of the family system. Now, there's variation, obviously, across individuals. Men can be nurturing, too. But on the whole, I don't think I'm say, giving you a newsflash here. Women tend to be a whole lot more nurturing. And as a result, when you need a hug and you need nurturing, dad's hugs are great. Mom's hugs are better. They just are. Doesn't matter if you're four or if you're 40. That's the wonderful way that God created women and moms. What do dads bring to the family system? Well, very often dads are the one that say, get off your rear end and go do something. Let's go out and play. Let's get busy. Let's get out there in the world. Let's try some new things. That doesn't mean that moms can't do that too. I'm sure they do. 
But men tend to be the ones who call their kids to grow up and be responsible. And you need both. You need the nurture and the care when you're having a bad day or when you've been knocked down by life and you need somewhere to go get some nurturing and you need somebody who can encourage you to get back up and go out there and face life's challenges. Now, when it comes to the biblical view of the family, we're not given all the details as to why God created it the way he did. But we are told that God created an order for male and female to create a family where children could, where they could multiply and fill the earth. And this is mentioned, we're not going to get to all of it today, but this is mentioned in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul several times. In fact, almost everywhere Paul talks about marriage or husbands and wives or parents and children, fathers and mothers, anytime he mentions that, he points back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. He points back to that created order. And I'm going to read with you a strange, bizarre passage from the New Testament that you might not have read in a long time or ever. But it's one of those places where Paul is mentioning the relationship between men and women. And he points back to Genesis. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning there in verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 Beginning there in verse 2, it says, Now I praise you because you remember me in everything. I think we have that slide up there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold fast to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know, I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of the woman. And God is the head of Christ. Every man who prays or prophesies with something on his head dishonors his head. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since that is one and the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman doesn't cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her head be covered. And a man should not cover his head because he is the image and glory of God. So too woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman came from man. Neither was man created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. This is why a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Well, if you weren't confused... By the time you got to verse 10, Paul just throws in something about the angels just to really mess with you. Because I don't know what that means. You don't know what that means. I don't know anybody who knows what that means. I can guess, since we're reading a context that seems to have something to do with authority, that the fact that the angels, some of them anyhow, rebelled against the authority of God... That when godly women take on that role that they've been given under the headship of their spouse and under the headship of Christ and under the headship of God, that that is a witness toward the angels. But I don't know. That's pure speculation. I have no idea why he said because of the angels. But I do know this. When Paul's saying the reason women in Corinth are to keep their heads covered when they pray or prophesy... It's because of the way things were in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Because of the created order. He plays this little word game, right? The head of... Uh, Christ is the head of every man. The man is the head of every woman. And God is the head of Christ. And then he talks about praying or prophesying with your head covered or uncovered. Why? Because of a, it's a symbol of authority. So you have a context of authority. You have the word head. And now some folks... You might have heard this debate about uh, the word head, uh, kephale is the, the Greek word here. And sometimes people will say, well, that word is used in Greek sometimes to refer like the, the head or the source of a river or a stream. And so that had been pursued by scholars for a while. It's largely been abandoned because in all of Greek literature, which we can now uh, 
basically review with computer-assisted technology. In all of Greek literature, in the New Testament, outside the New Testament, any time it means the source of a stream or rivers, it's in the plural. The heads of a river, the heads of a stream. It's never used in the singular except to refer to what's on top of your shoulders. And then when it's used metaphorically in the singular of that thing on top of your shoulders, it's used in the sense of authority. So that really is an aside, but you might hear that sometimes to suggest, well, this isn't about authority at all. It's weird if it's not about authority because there in verse 10, even though you got that strange thing about the angels, it's pretty clear that having her head covered is a symbol of authority. So authority is the context here. And what does this matter? What does this mean? What is, what is the point of all this? Well, in Corinth, apparently, the Christian women, and, and not just on this issue, this issue, but on a number of issues, they were struggling with the idea of, of uh, what we would call today Christian liberties, areas of conscience. If you read chapters 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, Paul talks about these Christians at Corinth and how they feel like, well, we've got rights to do what we want now as Christians. Um, some people thought in chapter eight, they thought I had a right to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And then some people, they had a conscience against that. They thought if I did that, it'd be wrong. And so uh, there was debate in the church and those who thought, well, an idol's nothing. They said, you can't make me not eat that meat because I have a right to eat that meat. And others are saying, you can't eat that meat. It's been offered to idols. In chapter 9, Paul says, I have a right to have a wife and to have uh, to be paid for my services as a gospel preacher. Now, he did not take that right, but he had a right to do it. And then in chapter 10, he goes back to the idea of eating meat and, and worshiping idols and things like that. The whole point up to chapter 11 is you may have a right to do something. But that doesn't mean it's the best thing to do. Because if you eat something that someone else has a conscience against and that causes them to sin by eating it as well. Well, now you have, you've really missed the plot. Or if Paul had preached and taken a salary, which he had every right to do, if that would have been a stumbling block to his evangelistic and missionary work, which very often that can be, right? That's why we here in the States, we pay for missionaries to go to other places in the world. So they are not asking the people they're reaching out to, to support them. We, we pay for that so that they can preach the gospel free of charge, as Paul would say, not because they don't have a right but because it would be better, it'd be expedient, it'd be what's best. And here in chapter 11, Paul says, you know what? Don't be uncovering your head when you're praying and prophesying in church if you're a woman. And don't cover your head if you're a man. Why? Why? Well, let's keep reading here in verse 11. It says, in the Lord, however, woman is not independent from man. And man is not independent of woman, for just as woman came from man, so comes uh, man comes through the woman, and all things come from God. And then he says in verse 13, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her as a covering? And verse 16 says, if anyone wants to argue about this, we have no other custom, nor do the churches of God. Paul's talking about customs, about hair styles and head coverings. And in that culture, you would wear a head covering, especially if you were going to go do some religious service. And women everywhere in society were expected to cover their heads. In fact, in Corinth, they had a police officer essentially who was in charge of the dress code and would go around making sure everybody was dressed appropriately and these christian people are saying you know what we're free in christ we're no longer under the law we're saved by grace we don't have to follow these customs anymore we're going to be free and paul says hold on hold on 
hold on. Think about what this might say. Your whole world, your whole culture sees that covering as a respect for the family structure and the societal structure. And you taking that off is essentially seen as rebellion against good things that we don't want to dismantle. And so Paul says, let's not do that. And furthermore, we do want to uphold the created order that began in Genesis 1 and 2. That's important. We want to uphold that created order, and we want to uphold it in a way that is culturally relevant to the church of Corinth. Now, you may be asking yourself right now, does that mean if I'm a man, I got to keep my hair cut short? And if I'm a woman, I've got to either let my hair grow really long or I've got to wear a a veil all the time. Is that what we should be taking from this? No. Those were the cultural expressions of honoring the created order, honoring the structure of family at the time Paul's writing. Today, if you put a little veil on your head, nobody's going to know what that means. They're going to think, she must like veils. Are you going to a wedding? It just doesn't connect anymore. If a man wears long hair instead of the Roman Caesar cut, which was all the fashion back in the day, people don't automatically think, well, he's rejecting the authority of God in his life, the authority of Jesus. He's rejecting the authority of the state or any of those things. He's a barbarian. They're they're not necessarily thinking that. It depends sometimes. It can go that way. Certainly there have been movements where people have have taken a countercultural approach to be rebellious in a way that doesn't seem to fit with the biblical vision of the family. And then, of course, that last statement, uh, well, a couple things there. He says, judge for yourselves. Is it proper? So if this was a matter of you know, biblical command, like the command not to eat of the tree, Paul wouldn't be asking the Corinthians to decide for themselves and to ask whether it was appropriate in their judgment. That's asking about what's the culturally relevant expression that fits with the created order that we're trying to uphold. What do you think is the appropriate thing to do in Corinth at that time? Now, today, we could ask that same question. We might need to be asking that same question. What is appropriate for men and women to wear? What is proper in terms of how we conduct ourselves? And we, I mean, the world seems to be moving into a, what I would call a, not not necessarily a, they used to call it a unisex uh, fashion and expression but now it seems to be going into almost just an ugly fashion and expression maybe I'm old maybe that's what's going on but it just seems like any way to ugly up uh, uh, not just women but men too you know in the 40s you see those pictures of people in line even in the 30s during the depression they're all in line to get what they can get to feed their families. They're dirt poor. You see these old pictures of these folks in line who are suffering in the depression, dirt poor, and they're dressed to the nines. They're wearing suits and ties because there was a sense of the way you present yourself matters. And it still matters. It's just what is it we're trying to communicate with the way we present ourselves. Now, that's all a matter of opinion, right? That's all a matter of judgment. What do you think is proper? And I just lay it before you. When we're faced with these issues, we have to figure out the cultural expression that aligns with the biblical order. How can we honor what God created in Genesis 1 and 2 in terms of male and female and the family in today's world? Not in Corinthian terms, with head coverings and all that, 
but in the terms that we live today. Now, next week, we're going to go a little further into Ephesians and some other passages where Paul talks about male and female, husband and wife, mother, father, children, and how all of this is rooted in the way we were created in God's image. We don't have to wonder about these things. God has revealed them to us in such a way that we can know the truth about human nature, about marriage and the family. Let's pray together this morning. Gracious God, our Father, we do thank you, we praise you for not leaving us to our own devices, our own human reasoning, but revealing to us through the light of your word, the truth, the truth of who we are is created in your image and likeness, the truth about the purpose of our lives to, to represent and reflect your will, to obey you to steward the blessings you've given us. And Father God, to glorify you. We pray that we can do this with your help. And we pray, Father, that you would bless men and women today, whether they be single or married, that you'd bless marriages and families, that you bless children that are growing up with a mom and dad and those who are growing up without that situation. We pray, Father, that you would with your grace and your mercy and your comfort, provide exactly what each of us may need to not be alone, to not be lost, and to find our way back to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.